Hi. Thank you for worshiping with us at Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. We are glad to have you on board as part of our online community. Thank you for carving out time to make worship a priority. We gather for worship in person and online to glorify God and so that the people of God might be sanctified, so that we, Christ's children, might be shaped into the loving image of Jesus Christ. Now hear this word of good news as we begin our time together. God loves you. And so do we. Welcome to worship at Pleasant Hill. We're glad to have you along. Now hear these words from James chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. If any of you are suffering, they should pray. If any of you are happy, they should sing. If any of you are sick, they should call for the elders of the church. And the elders should pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer that comes from faith will heal the sick, for the Lord will restore them to health and if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. For this reason, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person is powerful in what it can achieve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. Your promises are true So my hope and trust Remain in you And I trust you Lord In the eye of the storm You remain in control And in the middle of the war You guard my soul You alone are the anchor When my sails are torn your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control and in the middle of the war. You guard my soul. You alone are the maker. When the 
clothes are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm Your love surrounds me In the eye of the Yusuf was a four-year-old Arab boy who lived with his family in Jordan. And one day he went to work with his dad. And his dad was a carpenter. And his dad was rebuilding a house. And he remembered having a conversation with his dad about a wall that was in the kitchen of this home they were rebuilding. His dad said, come, Yusuf. We must justify that wall. Justify? asked a confused four-year-old boy, and his dad replied, Yes, son, we need to justify. When something is crooked or out of balance, and we need to try and make it straight or appear to be straight, we call it justifying. If the wall is not crooked or not out of balance, it doesn't need to be justified. So keeping this notion of justified or justification in, in mind, we're going to fast forward a year in the life of Yusuf. Remember, if something's crooked or out of balance, it needs to be justified. If something is already in line, no justification is needed. Now, Yusuf, a firm five years old, is asleep in his family's home. He's awakened by shouting and, and gunfire. You see, Yusuf grew up in the Jordan during the time of the height of the Arab-Jewish fighting surrounding the establishment of Israel in 1948. Hearing the commotion outside, Yusuf's dad grabs Yusuf and his two sisters and throws them into their parents' room. He pulls a rifle out from under the bed. He pulls on his boots and he says... Stay here, don't come out for anyone until I return, God willing. Those were the last words that Yusuf ever heard his dad say because when all the commotion had settled, when the fighting was done for that day, Yusuf's dad was among the dead. After Yusuf's dad died, Yusuf's mom moved the family to Bethlehem. Now, during this time in Bethlehem, the commerce was really heavily driven by Christians making the pilgrimage to see the original birthplace of Jesus. So Yusuf, by the age of eight, had been hired as what they call a street hustler. His job was to go out into the streets of Bethlehem and get the tourists who were there to kind of feel sorry for him, and then he would lead them back into the shops so that the tourists could spend their money in the shops of the shop owners that employed Yusuf. Yusuf shared this job with other people out on the street, and one person in particular he shared the streets with was a gentleman by the name of Mordecai Levan. Mordecai was blind, and Mordecai was of Jewish descent. Now, it was an extremist Jewish group that was responsible for the fighting on the day that Yusuf's dad died. Regardless, Yusuf at this time in his life had no use for anyone of Jewish descent. One day, Mordecai was asking a passerby for help, and in doing so, he stumbled, and this blind individual dropped his purse, and all the coins inside spilled out, and Yusuf saw what happened on that day. And Yusuf said in a testimony that he felt within himself an innate desire was the word that he used to help Mordecai in that moment, to help him find his purse, and to gather together all the coins that had spilled out onto the street. And in that moment, Yusuf had a choice. He could act on what was the initial innate desire to help another human being. Or, as he said, he could betray that innate desire and walk away. 
Walking away was the path that he chose on that day. And as he walked away from this individual who needed his help, he was saying to himself, serves him right. His people cause so many other people pain. He deserves to suffer today. Never mind the fact that Mordecai was blind. Mordecai could not fight in any sort of battle. Mordecai was not there the day that Yusuf's dad died. He just happened to be of Jewish descent. You see, in this moment, Yusuf was seeing Mordecai as an it rather than a human being. And as he walked away, Yusuf had to justify what he did on that day. Because to betray that innate desire to help someone else, to make the world a better place for someone else, is to behave in a crooked manner or out of balance. And so in behaving out of balance within himself, Yusuf had to, in turn, attempt to justify what he had done. Now, this story of Yusuf and and Mordecai is given to us in the Arbinger Institute's book, The Anatomy of Peace, Resolving a Heart of Conflict. It's a good book. Um, It helps uh, resolving in conflict, and it gives us a perspective on ways in which we can keep our hearts at peace. In fact, the premise of the book is to help the reader see the importance of acting in ways that intentionally keep our hearts at peace, therefore making the world better for us and for other people, instead of acting in ways that put our hearts at war with other people or with other entities that lead to crooked or out-of-balance behavior Because this crooked or out-of-balance behavior then requires us to justify, oftentimes erroneously, what we have just done. Essentially, what this book helps us understand is, if our hearts are at peace, we can be agents of healing in an out-of-balance world. The letter of James picks up on this same motive, this same theme. It's the letter of James is what we call New Testament wisdom literature. Some even say that this is a sermon uh, that was preached in the New Testament church. And it really helps the reader of the letter or the listener of the sermon try to live a life that is more in balance, not to live such an out-of-balance, crooked life where we have to justify what we do one to another, but essentially to make the world a better place for all people and to glorify God. In this letter, James initially challenges us to choose a team. James says you have to choose a team. You have to choose God's team or the world's team. You can't choose both. God's team will encourage love, foster relationships, make the world a better place. The world's team is more interested in furthering the self, even if it is at the expense of others. And then James gives us some stories. One story is this. Imagine with me, if you will, a wealthy person and a poor person walk into worship, and you treat the wealthy person who represents the world's team with great respect, but you treat the poor person badly, putting them at your feet in the place of shame. And James says, no, 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 no. God's team does not operate that way. Because when you do that, you're treating the poor person as if they are an it instead of a human being. That's not how God's team works. Then James challenges us to control our tongue and our actions by resisting the devil, drawing near to God so that God will draw near to us. The nearer that we are to God, the more full we are of God, the less likely we are to betray our innate desires to help and treat one another with respect and love. The closer we are to God means we are literally already justified through God. We don't have to justify our out-of-balance behavior. 
And then in our text today, James is wrapping up this letter, wrapping up his sermon, and he's landing the plane. And he does so on a powerful notion of finding balance and forgiveness. James says, if any of you are sick, now sick here does not just mean physically ill, though that is a part of the word that's used here. It literally means out of balance. Are any of you out of balance in any area of your life? Are you out of balance with God, with others, with creation, with your own emotions? Are you out of balance with your health? Of course, that's in there too. Can you relate to any of this? Are any of you out of balance? Maybe in one or more ways. Because being out of balance in any one or more of these ways can literally lead to our hearts being at war. They will rage against the world and the relationships around us. And if so, James says, if you can relate to this and if you're out of balance, call the church leaders together so that they may pray over you. And not just pray, but pray in the name of the Lord. Because James here makes it clear that it is only through Jesus that we can be forgiven of our sins and our lives and our relationships then put back into balance. Though we might try in vain and erroneously to justify our out-of-balance behavior, James says it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be truly, truly justified or made straight or made whole and put back into balance. Our best efforts simply will not do it. It takes an act of God at work within us. But through Jesus Christ, we can be put back in balance and our hearts can be put at peace. The point that James is really trying to drive home here is this. If our hearts are at peace, we can be agents of healing in an out-of-balance world. Just like James in this passage is wrapping up his letter or his sermon... We are wrapping up our first sermon series of this new year, 2021. The sermon series has been entitled, Welcome. And it has challenged us to many things, just as James has challenged us in his letter to step out of our out-of-balanced living and enter into balanced living through Jesus Christ. The sermon series has kind of had sort of the same flair. Remember all the way back to the baptism of the Lord Sunday, the first Sunday of this particular sermon series, where we were to remember the welcoming waters of baptism. And we were challenged to live into our baptismal covenant fully afresh and anew. And then the week after that, we heard God speaking to Samuel and God called Samuel to be something greater than Samuel ever thought he could be. And Samuel was totally unqualified at the time to be who he became. And we were challenged to listen to the welcoming voice of God and the welcoming voices around us that challenge us to be so much more than we ever thought we could be despite our lack of qualifications. Then in the third week of this sermon series, we looked at welcoming others. And if you were with us, this one got a whole lot of traction because of the quote by Bob Goff that said, we can confront others with their failures or surround them with our love. Either way will be remembered. You pick. That struck a chord with me. And when I preached it, it struck a chord with so many of you. You made comments to me about it and how you took that out into the world and talked to your relatives and friends. And that one really gained some traction. And for that, I'm thankful for. But it was a severe challenge to us. It was a challenge to us to step out of our out of balancedness and try to step into a greater level of balance through Jesus Christ, through welcoming others. Then last week, we looked at welcoming each other, whereby we are to live in Christ's community so that everyone within the community feels loved, welcome, and needed. This week, as we close out this sermon series, we are to welcome healing. Now, I think in the midst of a pandemic, it's pretty safe and easy to say we could all use some level of healing, and I get that. But I'm not just talking about physical healing from physical ailments, though that is included in here. I'm talking about God's healing that puts 
our entire lives back in balance. So I ask you, are any of you sick? Are any of you out of balance? Are you living into your baptismal vows and covenant completely? Or is something lacking? Are you listening to and responding to the welcoming voice of God and others around us calling us to be so much more than we ever thought we could be despite our lack of qualifications? Are you listening to those voices or is something lacking? Are you welcoming others, even those that are different from you, or is something lacking? Are you welcoming each other so that everyone in the sacred community of Christ feels loved, welcome, and needed, or is something lacking? Or maybe I should ask this question. Are all of your relationships healthy, or is something lacking? Is something broken down between you and someone else? Are all of your emotions healthy, or is something lacking? Is your physical body healthy or is something lacking? Is your spiritual life completely whole or is something lacking? If you said, no, we're not whole in any or all or part of these respects, then something in your life is out of balance. So in the spirit of James' letter or James' sermon, I would like for us to take a moment to pause I would like for us to take a moment to really welcome and receive healing, to get ourselves into a posture of receiving God's healing for all of those out-of-balance places in our lives. Now, if you happen to make your way to one of our in-person worship services this week, we're actually going to anoint one another with oil and pray over one another. But I can't really do that uh, for our online congregation and online community. But know that you're important and you're valued and you're loved. So we're just going to handle this same notion, but we're going to handle it a little bit different. So if you would, I would like for you uh, to kind of go through this regimen of grounding yourself in this particular moment to where you are focused and relaxed and in a posture to receive God's healing. So if you would, I would like for you to find a seat um, somewhere comfortable that you're not going to be wiggling around or trying to, to get up from. So just find a comfy place to sit down. I want you to put your feet on the floor. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to start by feeling your feet on the floor. Maybe you're barefoot. Maybe you have hardwood floor and they're a little bit cold this morning. Or maybe you have carpet and you feel the fuzziness beneath your feet. Maybe you have on socks and you feel your feet radiating some warmth and you feel the ground underneath your feet. I just want you to to put your feet on the ground and feel the ground beneath you and begin grounding yourself. Then I want that feeling to permeate from your feet up into your legs and then into, into your thighs. And I want the muscles in your legs and thighs to relax as if you belong where you're sitting, as if you should be there, as if you were called to be there this morning just for a moment such as this. Then I want this feeling to continue up your body into your chest. And I want you to focus on your breathing. Feel yourself breathing. Get into a rhythm of feeling yourself breathing. Breathe in through your nose for four counts. Hold for four counts and breathe out for eight. Do that just a couple of times. And I want you to exhale for twice as long as you inhale because I want you to breathe out any toxins or anxieties that might be within you. As you inhale, I want you to breathe in the goodness of the Holy Spirit. Hold that goodness within you, then exhale for eight beats so that anything that might be pent up or built up in your lungs can be pushed out so that you have as much room for God's presence as possible. Now that you're filled, 
with the Holy Spirit. Relax your shoulders. We like to tense up right there. Relax your shoulders. You're supposed to be here in this moment. Be here fully. Next, let this feeling permeate up into your face. Relax the muscles in your face. We have a tendency to clench our teeth or squint. Relax the muscles in your face and even relax your eye muscles so that you are as relaxed as you possibly can get. And I want you to begin feeling the anxiety slowly drifting out of the top of your head and out of your lungs, out into the world so that you may be completely filled with God's goodness. Now, in this relaxed state, I hope that you can feel the hands of angels touching you, God's beloved praying over you and cheering you on. And as you're relaxed and you're feeling the very messengers of God place their hands on your shoulders and on your back and on the top of your head, allow me to offer a blessing and pray over you too. Beloved of God, I pray over you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the power of God's indwelling presence heal you of all illnesses, of body, mind, spirit, and relationships, that you may serve God with a loving and whole heart that is at peace. Almighty God, I pray for all who have worshipped here with us. May they be comforted in their suffering and made whole. When they are afraid, give them courage. When they feel weak, grant them your strength. When they are afflicted, afford them patience. When they are lost, offer them hope. When they are alone, move us to their side. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And together the people of God said, Amen. If our hearts are at peace we can be agents of healing in an out-of-balance world. May your hearts be at peace in receiving God's healing, God's wholeness, God's balance for your life this day. Now, beloved of God, go forth to be an agent of healing in this out-of-balance world. The more I seek you, the more I find you. The more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe and feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. Look.
love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I'm melting your peace, it's overwhelming. Once again, thank you for worshiping with us at Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. It was our privilege and honor to have you worshiping with us today. We are so glad that you have chosen maybe over an extended period of time. Maybe this is your first time visiting. It really doesn't matter. We're just glad to have you. And if you would like to um, uh, participate in furthering the mission and ministry of Pleasant Hill, uh, your financial giving would be very much appreciated takes money to make ministry happen. That's just the world that we live in. The easiest way to give is through our website at www.ph.church. On the homepage, you'll find a giving tag. Clip on, click on that tab and fill out a simple form. Fill it in for whatever amount you want as a one-time or reoccurring gift. And you can even pick which fund you want to designate your giving to. Thank you for your faithful and generous giving. You can also mail a check to the church office. Make your check payable to Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. Fill it in for whatever amount you want and mail it here at 2705 County Road 222, Florence, Alabama, 35633. Once again, thank you for your faithful and generous giving. Maybe you happen to have your cell phone handy right now and it's just easier to give via text. If you would, please text the word GIVE to 256 8012055. Follow the prompts, give them whatever amount you so desire. Thank you for your faithful and generous giving. Each gift makes a difference in the life of the church, therefore making a difference in the life of our community. Now, beloved of God, receive the benediction. If our hearts are at peace, we can be agents of healing in an out of balance world. This week, welcome God's healing by trying to put one out-of-balance relationship back in balance by refusing to yell 
and instead offering grace. Replace one out-of-balance meal with a healthy one. Set aside two times a day to simply inventory your emotions and address whatever is welling up inside of you. And as you go to love and serve God, go knowing that the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of God's people. That is good news, and together we rejoice by saying, Amen. 